Howdy, everybody. We're going to give people a minute or two to uh, to arrive, but we'll get started shortly. I want to thank everybody for coming out. It's uh, fantastic to be here at CMS Philly. Um, you can see me and my special guest who's on from the United Kingdom across the pond, Tom Dyson. Um, Hi, everyone. Tom is yep. uh, the founder and CTO at Torchbox, who are the folks who started Wagtail. So it's, uh, it's nice that we're able to do this and bring him in with us. Um, so we'll give people another minute or two, and then uh, and then we'll dive right in. All right, I guess it's about 9.02 now, um, so we may as well get started. We've got a, a bunch of attendees, so it's great to see you all coming in. And uh, welcome to CMS Philly. I wanted to throw a big thank you out to the CMS Philly organizer team. Um, I'm an organizer of conferences myself. Uh, I help run the local Philly Python users group. I've helped organize or host Bar Camp Philly for... Uh, just about every year, I guess since the third one was the first year I was one of the lead organizers and I've been either host or organizer every year since. And uh, I help run DjangoCon US, so I really uh, appreciate the organizers. So if you see any organizers over the course of the day online, uh, working hard organizers or volunteers, be sure to give them a virtual pat on the back for a job well done, um, because this is a lot of work and uh, especially navigating, having to do it virtually online, uh, they definitely deserve our gratitude and appreciation. Um, so without further ado, welcome to uh, Wagtail, the only CMS I still love after years. Uh, my name is Timothy Allen. I'm an IT director uh, over at Wharton Research Data Services at the Wharton School. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm Flipper PA online basically everywhere. So uh, GitHub, Facebook, Twitter, feel free to track me down and ask any questions. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, we've got a special guest, Tom Dyson on, who's the founder and CTO of Torchbox who are the company that started Wagtail and uh, still are the maintainers of the open source project. Um, before I go any further, I want to give a big shout out to my cat, Madeline. Today is her 18th birthday, and she would be quite cross with me if I did not wish her a big happy birthday. So happy birthday to my kitty. Um, so I want to start with a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, I absolutely love WordPress. I know it well. I've used it frequently over the years, and it's a great tool. Um, it's a great blogging system, but I've noticed over the years, I had a tendency to try to make it do way too much. I am very guilty of that. I tried to make WordPress do everything over the years instead of letting it do what it does well. And I've noticed that I'm not the only one that does that. And uh, during this talk, um, there are several points where I'll show anti-patterns within WordPress. And this is by no means to bash WordPress. Um, it's a great system. Um, but there will be times where I, I point out some uh, some things it doesn't do as well as perhaps some other systems do. Um, there are plenty of things it excels at. Though. So I just wanted to get that out of the way up front and first. So here's exhibit A of problems I've run into in Wagtail. And this is totally a mea culpa. So this is a website we did for my division of Wharton a couple of years ago, Wharton Research Data Services, uh, where we decided we had to create a private Stack Overflow community within our site. So what we do, we, uh, we have about 60,000 users from across the world from about 500 different business schools, Harvard, Stanford, MIT, you know, the subpar business schools, the ones that aren't working. And uh, we wanted to create a private question and answer community for researchers to ask researchers um, information about, uh, you know, finance questions and discussions and conversations. And uh, to do this, we used, we built it using WordPress, BuddyPress, and a bunch of custom plugins and themes that we built ourselves. Um, this was a bad move for us because it ended up adding a ton of technical debt where we introduced dependencies for PHP, MySQL, WordPress, and BuddyPress when we were already a shop that ran ColdFusion, Perl, uh, SQL Server, and a bunch of other systems. So it really just increased our technical debt. We also, uh, had to create a secondary WordPress theme that would have to be manually updated separately whenever we updated our main site. And with everything in WordPress being sort of based around the concept of a post or a page, um, that really doesn't fit what we were trying to do here. Is a conversation a post? Is a reply within a conversation a post? And how do you define the relations between them within WordPress? It felt very forced. And putting everything into the WP post meta table in the database through meta information uh, caused some pretty big data integrity problems for us. Um, first of all, it's a JSON field within a MySQL text column, so it's not indexable. 
which makes it very hard to scale or search. So for example, if we wanted to search within that field, it became nearly impossible. The other big problem we had is an age old problem, humans. And you'll see here that uh, we ran into an issue where this is another site I worked on. This is the old uh, site for AA's group in Philadelphia, um, where we needed more features. And with WordPress, a problem we ran into is we'd find a plugin that would do about 90% of what we needed. So we'd install it and it would do mostly what we needed. But now we still have a problem. We have to maintain that plugin and still account for the other 10% we needed to do. So then we install another WordPress plugin to account for the other 10%. Now we have two plugins that we need to keep up with. And whenever we do upgrades or anything like that, uh, you know, we've got disparate release cadences, certain plugins don't support new versions of WordPress. It became an issue. And this isn't just a WordPress problem, but it's exacerbated within the WordPress community because of how tightly coupled they are to the database. Um, another problem we had with WordPress is it is very hard to have a development environment. Um, there are actually plugins which are written to try to solve this problem, where you can back up your production database, replace all the strings as necessary because it stores full URLs and restore it in dev. But I found all of these really frustrating and time consuming. And, uh, you know, when you're using base WordPress for something, you have to learn one way of doing things. But if you have five plugins, you have to learn five different ways of doing things. So for us, it became clear that, uh, you know, in both of these cases, we had a square peg trying to go into a round hole. Um, within WordPress, everything, all these plugins were cramming everything into the body and the content field. And these short tags that got inserted were a nightmare that kind of locked us into those plugins. So for example, if we were using a gallery ID that used a short tag that put them within the text, what happens if that gallery software stops being supported? Um, it also makes search very difficult because looking within the body field, trying to feed that to any search engines, such as, um, you know, Elasticsearch or something like that for a search, uh, becomes very tricky. Um, so WordPress's search was always, always a challenge for us. Um, anything beyond the base offerings of MySQLs like functionality um, became very problematic for us. And, uh, you know, we ran into problems where there were security holes in plugins that were no longer being supported by their author. And um, there was no common interface between the plugins as well. Some plugins had their settings under a plugin part of the menu, while other plugins put their plugins under the part of settings. And if we slide back a slide, you'll see here, if you look carefully at this, you'll see that the left hand navigation is so long that it goes off the screen. And uh, on the right hand side, I did a sort of mini map like you'd have in a code editor where you can see how far that left lab navigation goes on and just how long the main part of the screen does. It really became untenable. So again, this isn't to bash WordPress, but this is sort of human nature is once we're locked into a solution to try to keep going with it uh, to the better end. So some quick definitions before we dive into sort of why we landed on Wagtail as a solution for these problems. but. Python is a general purpose programming language. It can be used for processing data, making music, building websites, and much more. Django is a web framework written in Python. Instagram, Pinterest, and the Washington Post all use Django. Um, Wagtail is a content management system for Django. It is used by many well-known entities, Wharton, Google, NASA, the Royal College of Art. And HTTP is a protocol that powers the entire web. It takes a request and returns a response. All of those tools are open source, which means they are developed by a community and the source is freely available. This also means how we can see how all of it works. Um, a lot of WordPress, that is true too, but many of the plugins are also paid. Um, so Wagtail, what makes it special? Wagtail is different from other CMSs because upfront Wagtail says you need a developer. So there's no quick start and it encourages upfront planning. Um, you know, with many CMSs, you hear about, you know, oh, it only takes five minutes to install and it's so easy to use and you can just install plugins. But I found that doesn't tend to be true. It's like, you know, when I've used WordPress in the past, it's like, oh, you don't need a developer until you want to do anything. And then you need 10 developers. 
this. <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't find that statement to be very true. I think if you really want a customized CMS, you're going to need a developer. And Wagtail is honest about that up front. It also provides a beautiful, simple interface for content creators that we'll go into where accessibility is not an afterthought. It's baked into the progress. Um, you can define relationships between content. Uh, you define the structure of the content. And a lot of this is done through the underlying Django ORM, the Object Relational Mapper. So it gives you programmatic control of different content types. And it's, it's a library that works within the Django ORM, extending what we get through Django models. So you can use things like foreign keys, and those relationships express themselves in the admin interface. We'll see that in a minute. And Wagtail is just Django, and Django is just Python. So you get access to the entire Mammoth ecosystem of Python packages at your disposal. It's one of the most impressive ecosystems I've ever seen of software. Um, you know, Python has been in the news a lot. It's trending up, up, up. It has been for years. And the ecosystem of scientific learning packages, machine learning, AI is absolutely incredible. And being able to tie these things into your CMS is really amazing. Uh, some of the demos Tom has done, done in the past of using AI to automatically do things like upload 100 images and have them automatically get tagged and add descriptions are pretty cool. And, uh, and you can see them on YouTube. <laughs> Um, but I wanted to give a special shout out to the stream field. Um, the stream field was the first killer feature of Wagtail, in my opinion, and what really sold me on it. It keeps content structured and it separates your display data, your CSS and your HTML from your content. What it does, it allows you as the developer of the content management system to develop different pages where the writer, the content creator, has access to different types of blocks. And a block could be a table, it could be an image, it could be a paragraph, it could be a header. We can define these blocks ourselves and then we can define what blocks the content creator gets to use. So rather than jamming everything into a body field, we get to give them the freedom they need and the admin, the structure they need. This also makes search much more straightforward. Also the WYSIWYG within Wagtail doesn't store as HTML in the database. It actually stores everything as JSON that is then converted to HTML on display. So structure is forced at every level. And this structure, you can index JSON within most databases. Also with Python, Django, and Wagtail, you're not locked into MySQL. So if you want a database that may have more features, such as Postgres, which contains the ability to index JSON, as well as a really killer full text search, um, you can switch over to Postgres, or SQL Server, or Oracle, or even SQLite. So before we move on to my next slides on 12-step recovery, let me hop over quickly and show you some of the things that we do. So over here, you can see a package that I've open sourced called Wagtail Content Stream. And what this contains is my most used stream fields. So if I come in here, I'm going to show you how I define a few blocks. So within here, you'll see that Wagtail comes with a whole bunch of blocks out of the box. So a choice block, a rich text block, a text block, a struct block, a stream block. Most of them are pretty straightforward, but you'll also see uh, document chooser blocks, embed blocks, these all come out of the box. And then a third party one that I've wrote is a code block. So you'll see here, I've taken a block, an image chooser block, and put it within another block, a cap captioned image block, where I wanna be able to not only provide an image, but also a caption, a credit for the image, an alignment for the image. And then I put that block within a content stream block which is what the actual editor will see. So within this content stream block, you'll see they can choose a heading, a paragraph, an image, a document, an embed, a table, or code. So what did that look like within the editor? I'm glad you asked. Through the magic of television, I have a page up and ready to go. And you'll see here within the body that we have these plus and minuses under each of these blocks. And you'll see up here, it says, this is a paragraph. This is a code block, but if I hit this plus, I can add a block above this paragraph. And let's say I want to add an image here. I can go ahead. This is the image block that I just showed you in code that also has the caption, the credit, and the alignment. You'll see through a straightforward definition, I can have pretty granular control about all, how all this works. So let's align the center. Let's credit this to CMS Philly and put a caption of Skyrim VR is beautiful. And if I go ahead and preview this, you'll see that right up top, 
there's now that image before it goes into the various blocks below. So that happened pretty much instantly. Now, if I come back and I'll show you that code block that you saw that I made an example of, you'll see it's not just different piece. You can inject JavaScript and other pieces to make these very robust. So if you take a look here at the code, I've selected Python. Now, if I start typing in real time, for x in range one comma five, print x, import this, you'll see in real time, it's giving me syntax highlighting as I code right below. So if I go ahead and preview, you'll see that on the other side, you get beautifully custom, you get beautiful syntax highlighted code on the flip side. So that's an example of how the blocks all work together. So that was really a killer feature for me. So getting back to the presentation, what does this all have to do with 12-step recovery? Well, 12-step recovery groups are anarchies in the best sense of the word. And AA is probably the largest, but you've probably heard of other 12-step fellowships such as NA, uh, Narcotics Anonymous, Overeaters on Anonymous, Gamblers Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous, there's, there are a ton. And um, how does Wagtail help these recovery groups? Well, tradition four of all 12 step groups states that each group should be autonomous except in matters affecting other groups or AA or the recovery group as a whole. And intergroups exist in the same manner, which serve the meetings in a given area. So, for example, Philadelphia is served by Sepia, the Southeastern Pennsylvania Intergroup of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, since the 1940s, this has made it extremely difficult to keep an up-to-date worldwide database of meetings. All attempts have failed when there's been a central organization which intergroups would report changes to. But technology has changed this. And we started by creating a WordPress plugin that any of these groups in any city could use. But many different groups use different technologies. WordPress, Drupal, the MS stack, Django, flat HTML, and WordPress just wasn't scaling for some of these larger groups. We also had created an app that kind of sat as a parent to all of these groups worldwide. And it would pull from APIs each group. So as the group updated, we first, for the first time had a worldwide database. Um, but I decided once we had sort of outgrown our WordPress installation here in Philadelphia, um, to give it a try with Wagtail. And it's been a night and day difference for the folks in the office as well as our scale. And we've put a React front end in front of all this that is now gonna end up being shared between uh, WordPress, Drupal, uh, Django, Wagtail. Everything will pull in through the same API. So the same API that is feeding the mobile app for iPhone and Android will also be feeding our web front end rather than having two separate courses. So this is the old setup that used to exist within the Philly AA office where you had the internet. We had a web server out in DigitalOcean that hosted Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP, and WordPress. And then a bunch of local PCs and a file server with MS Access and QuickBooks. And a Python script would export the current AA meetings from MS Access in the office into WordPress versus via a very ugly ETL process every day at 5.45 a.m. All the meetings were geocoded against Google's geocoding API en route. But this is where I became very familiar with how ugly storage within the WordPress database can be and uh, how much goes into post meta and uh, how sort of arcane, what kind of arcane sorcery you need to know to muck about in there. And uh, the meeting and location data were both stored in WordPress as custom post types. But is that really the best way of doing things? Um, so we decided to try a different way. So without further ado, let's go back to the live demo. And you'll see over here that within the Wagtail meeting guide, we get to define what a region is. So a region would be, for example, the Gaberhood is within the county of Philadelphia, which is in the state of Pennsylvania, et cetera. And you'll see here that we get to define what a location is. So within a location, 
we have a foreign key pointing to what region it's in, which will automatically be exposed as a dropdown within the interface. We have a formatted address, and if you take a and a lat long, and if you take a look at the former at the formatted address and the lat long, you'll see that comes up as geocoded address as a multi-field panel using this handy tool called a Wagtail Geo Widget, which allows us to have a basically an auto-completing Google Maps within the, within the admin itself. It's similar to the code block I showed you, but for maps. Um, you'll also see we have distinct meeting types, and then we define the meeting itself, not as part of a post, not with any of the information crammed into post meta, but all of it as first order objects. So for example, if I were to come here into the dashboard now, and I come to locations and meetings, and I edit the friends meeting house, let's say. You'll see within the friends meeting house, after the definition I've just given, we'll have a region that's a drop down because it's a foreign key to another model object. So it keeps a strict definition there. We can include any details, but then within the geocoded address, here's another block. Now that's not one I had to write. That's one that I just installed and out of the box I get a really nice block here where I can put in, let's put in my home address, and you'll see it automatically geocodes and autocompletes after I put in the address and drops the pin right in. Or, uh, you know, where I host a lot of events, 3730 Walnut Street, Huntsman Hall, right on Penn's campus, automatically geocoded. And then another cool part of this is after that, if uh, let's say I want to send them to the Locust Street entrance the locust walk entrance i can drag that pin over to the locust walk entrance and it will automatically geocode to the to the proper location so it'll keep the address but geolocate so that's something i got free for out of the box and then on the meeting level so if i come down you'll see there's a parent child relationship here built so all of the meetings are children of the location where they are in so if i go ahead and edit this and I promise I'm wrapping up. <laughs> You'll see all those fields I defined within the meeting are here. And this really proved itself to be important because I was able to, within a matter of hours, get video conference URLs and video conference phone fields, as well as Venmo and PayPal URLs in place um, within just a matter of hours. And we got it out and when COVID hit, and we had to get these meetings online, it allowed us to be dexterous and agile and move on. So what did that look like? And then I'll turn over to Tom. On the front end, all these locations and meetings are wrapped together. Sorry, I'm asking my old MacBook to do a lot of work here. <laughs> there it goes. You'll see within here, we have a React front end. So all of those are exposed through an API a RESTful API that the React front end then picks up. And let's say I just want to see online meetings. I can go ahead and search online and you'll see, bam, here are all the online meetings. And if I want to go to, uh, to a specific meeting, I can bring up the meeting details in the React app and you'll see there's a big join button for the video conference and voila. <laughs> So it's come a long way. And one last thing I will show you, because this is pretty cool. If I come to one of the pages, and let's just hop into the edit page. What I'm going to do is hop over here to a random Google spreadsheet. And I could come to any spreadsheet I want, whether it's uh, Google or not. I'm just going to select a whole bunch of random data from this spreadsheet here, from the My Minions spreadsheet. And let's say I want to add a table in here. This gives you an idea of how many blocks are out there out of the box that you can use. So I'm going to just go ahead and add a table. And here I'm just going to paste in the data I brought out. And you'll see that copies in the entire table 
And now if I go to preview, you'll see that in the middle of here, we have that table data displayed right within the page. So it's really a pretty incredible system, but um, I'm gonna stop there and hand it over to Tom and thank you all for your attention. And uh, Tom will give you a little bit more about the, uh, the history of Wagtail, where it's at and where it's going. Thanks very much. Thanks, thanks Tim. That was amazing. Uh, I, um, I hadn't seen that pasting the table data before actually. It works uh, better than I'd imagined. And I must say also that um, just seeing you uh, seeing you zoom in on those areas of Philadelphia makes me feel pretty uh, pretty nostalgic. Um, I I'm based here in the UK as you know, but uh, I've had a lot of opportunities thankfully to visit Philly over the last few years, and uh, I was hoping to be there soon. But I think it won't be a while now. But um, anyway, all those addresses are very uh, familiar, and uh, I have a lot of affection for them. I'm going to share my screen now. Um, while I do that. I might just say that uh, for people who um, who are on the call, if you have questions, then um, there's a question tool uh, built straight into this um, uh, GoToWebinar. I haven't used GoToWebinar before, but it seems to be working pretty well so far. If you have any questions, feel free to ask ask them here through this the UI, and um, either we can we can reply or we can uh, Tim or I will will call them out and and speak to them. But for now, I'm, I'm going to move on, and I'm going to talk more generally about Wagtail. And um, this is a sort of an updated version of a talk I've, I've given a couple of times, um, often at, at Wagtail or Django conferences, just to give an update on on where things are at the moment. So this is now, Tim's kind of given you a really helpful um, overview of Wagtail as a technology, and I'm just going to talk about kind of where it sits in the in the landscape of content management systems at the moment. So I'm going to start by what's going well. And, um, and a lot of things are going well in Whitehall. It's exciting for us. And one of the big reasons for that is is kind of down to luck that um, we picked Python when, when we first built Wagtail uh, back in back in 2013, because that was a language that, that uh, here at Torchbox that we used and we, we loved and we were building bespoke systems in. And, um, and at that time, uh, Python was you know, it wasn't exactly a niche language, but it was nothing. It was nothing like the level it's at today. And um, you've probably seen other graphs like this, but Python has has grown very fast and uh, is now the most popular programming language based on Stack Overflow, which is probably a pretty good metric. Not all of that is because of web development, and um, in fact, I think quite a lot of it is because Python has become the standard language in computer science courses, and also because it's it's so widely used in uh, for machine learning and big data, which are two of the the most active areas of computer science right now. So we've been lucky with that, really. You know, we picked we pick Python, and uh, Python's carried us a long way. Uh, also, Wagtail's doing well, and I use winning here in in a in a uh, with a kind of uh, air quotes because you know we're not uh, this isn't a big competition, and there are lots of fantastic tools out there. And um, but you know w when we want to kind of measure how we're doing and the impact we're, we're, we're having, we, we compare ourselves, of course, against other systems. And particularly in the Python world, there are a few excellent content management systems. One of the metrics we use, which I know is flawed, is, uh, is GitHub stars. So I guess that's a kind of measure of interest in the general developer population. It's, it's definitely not, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's a flawed metric, but it's, you know, it's, it carries some weight. And um, we're, we're on nearly 9,000 stars now, which is, um, you know, it's amazing for us as a, a fairly small team here in the UK that, to, to see this thing grow and be used around the world. And as well as all those, you know, thousands of people using Wagtail who we'll never know about, there are quite a few big names who we do know about. And um, and this this has made it really, this has really helped us, uh, especially re reassuring here at Torchbox, we work primarily in the nonprofit sector. So we, we, we see clients who are making the world a better place. and um, and that's 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 really rewarding, but also uh, it has its own challenges. And often people in that sector are quite risk averse. And so for us to be able to say that Wagtail's now being used by Google, so for example, uh, Google.blog and the Google Cloud blog, uh, Wagtail, or by the National Health Service here in the UK, which is I think still the world's fifth biggest employer, 
uh, uh, increasingly by NASA, um, and uh, it looks like the Jet Propulsion Laboratory are about to switch to Wagtail for their main site. And also Mozilla, which is lovely because Mozilla, you know, unlike unlike some of the other names on this list, are um, very open about everything they do. So uh, all of the work that Mozilla is doing in Wagtail, like the new um, developer at Mozilla.org, is all open source. You can look at it on on GitHub, and that means that you can you can learn from their own implementations. So you know, we we don't want to kind of stress too much on these big names, but it, it definitely helps us from a kind of marketing and reassurance point of view to be able to point to these these names. And th these are not just, you know, a lot of people kind of claim uh, claim claim these big brands for their technologies, but these are not kind of little bits of the NHS or Mozilla. This is the main NHS website that's currently getting, I think, 90 million sessions a month, uh, up from 45 um, in the current crisis. Over the last year, or more like six months, uh, we've shipped some pretty big features in Wagtail, and um, uh, the top of that list is uh, updating to to match the latest versions of the, the the language and the platform that we run on. So, as Tim said, it's a Python content management system. The, the current latest version of Python is 3.8. So, a lot of interesting features in 3.8, and uh, and Wagtail now supports that. So, if you want to take advantage of those new features, then you can you can do that. With Wagtail and similarly Django three, um, although it's quite a big number uptick, actually it's not a, it's not there weren't so many huge changes in Django three compared to the the two point X branch, but um, it's really important for us to to stay relevant and to make sure that we're tracking the Django updates frequently because we want to be you know the, the of course the content management system of choice for people who are using Django who, who are generally people who you know want to use the the latest and greatest features. Um, I'll talk briefly about release cycle. Actually, while I'm on this, uh, we we had um, before before we built and uh, adopted Wagtail at Torchbox. We were big Drupal users um, for about seven years. Uh, we were building, I think, probably some of the biggest nonprofit Drupal sites, particularly in the UK and, and, and across Europe. And Drupal was wonderful for us in many ways. A very powerful tool, and um, uh you know a lot of flexibility but there are also some some things about it which we struggled with from a technical point of view but also from the way the, the project was run and you know i've got every sympathy for that and now is that we've had to learn lessons about running open source projects but um the thing that was a real challenge for us was the really big uh gaps the big steps between versions of drupal so particularly between versions seven and eight uh where you know it was hoped for I think a year, a year and a half, and turned out to be over three years. And that that big gap makes it really hard to to plan large projects. So with Wagtail, we've taken a very different approach, where we have a, a very strict release schedule. So it's four times a year. The next one is due pretty much today. It's going to actually going to be on Mondays. So it's just the start of May, um, and we have a point release every every three months. And uh, and although that means sometimes we have a, re a, th a release without a load of really Glamorous features that we can talk about. It does mean that we uh, that the upgrades are straightforward. They should take. We target under half an hour for anyone to 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 run an upgrade, um, and it, and that predictability I think is really important for our audience. Uh, I won't go through all of this, but uh, another big feature is is workflow, customizable workflow. I must say this is something that we've um, we've slightly resisted over the years. It's always felt a bit like one of these kind of um, uh, enterprisey features that uh, that that people think they want but don't actually use. But we're starting to to understand ways that particularly big organisations, big news organisations, need more complex workflows. So, for example, the ability to say for this type of content, we want to uh, we want to uh, draft, write it, and then uh, ask our legal team to moderate it. And when the legal team are happy, they're going to push it to the editorial team to review, and then it goes live. Um, and uh, so coming up with a solution that, that is going to handle more complex workflows like that, but at the same time doesn't add unnecessary complexity for, for normal users, has been a challenge, but it's one that we're addressing now. Um, this, we're being funded to do to work on this by The Motley Fool, so fool.com. Some of you may be familiar with uh, who, who, who have adopted Whitehall in a big way and are being really, I think, excellent sort of progressive supporters of this uh, open source community. So we're really grateful for their support and their willingness to, to an encouragement of us to, to, to build this in a way that's going to help everybody. 
Uh, I'll just mention accessibility as well, which has been a big focus over the last year, and particularly from the wider community, uh, we, we run a few events and sprints and uh, accessibility is often one of the topics that uh, gets people most excited. And I think this is, um, you know, it's, it's something that, that open source products don't always have a great story for. And uh, we just want to, we, our, our goal is that, that Wagtail as the, you know, the edit interface, the admin interface should be accessible to everybody. And not, not just in a kind of checkbox way, like making sure we're providing alt text and so on, but in a way that, Kind of really tries to thoughtfully respond to to those requirements, and it's a kind of it's a it's a double it's a double point really because it's uh, on the one hand we want to make sure it's an accessible tool for for uh, for the users of the CMS, but we also want to we want to help authors and editors create accessible websites, and Wagtail is kind of unopinionated about the sort of sites you create, but we want to sort of guide people in the way to make it as easy as possible for people to make the right decisions about accessibility. Um, we've 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 lent on we've we've made quite a big deal about events over the years, and um, I think having people come together in in real life has been a really wonderful part of the community. Um, this the the current situation means that our plan to run Whitehall Space US, which for the last few years has been held in in Philadelphia at, at Washington, uh, won't happen in in the physical realm this year, but will happen online, and uh, that's scheduled for end of July. And that like this will be our our first virtual online conference so really um, this this experience for me actually is interesting to see how that might work and we're hoping for, uh, for an event in Iceland in September or October and um, depending on what the, the kind of travel situation is by then. We have a growing team the, the the core developer team is I think 19 or 20 now from around the world uh, we have a weekly meeting which we now have to do two times a day so we alternate between morning in the UK and the uh, end of the day in the UK so that we can so that people can can join from East and West Coast US and uh, the Philippines and Australia and uh, you know around the world. Um, the, our community support is, is strong. We've consolidated on Slack and Stack Overflow. We used to have a few more channels, but we, we thought it was better to do a good job of, of, of focusing on those two. And you know, those two are, are not perfect. And, um, and sometimes we have people saying we need to use Slack and we use IRC or you know other uh, kind of more open alternatives. but. Uh, from a practical point of view, we found that these two are the um, at least the easiest way for us to provide friendly, helpful support. Um, it's really been exciting seeing the the growth in community contributions, and you know I, I can't pretend this is like anything like the size of the the WordPress ecosystem, but there are increasingly some really high quality, mature, well tested uh, tools which which are being contributed by by around the the community. Um, because these are this is Python, then we use the pip, uh, the PyPy for package management. So most of these, you, it's just it's just a kind of a pip install, Wagtail content import, and then changing changing a few value, values, and you see this this magic new features appear. And if I have a minute, I'll I'll try and demo some of this. Um, let me just quickly. Uh, no, I think I'll I'll do a live demo later if we have time. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about was Code Red CMS. This has uh, um, really been an interesting development in the last year or two. And uh, Code Red is, I mean, you could describe it like a, a distribution of Wagtail. So Wagtail out of the box is very unopinionated about markup and it, it's sort of developer focused. So it um, it expects you to, to build up your site through defining models and creating your own templates, which I think is often the right approach, particularly for you know where you have developer capacity and um, where you want complete control over that experience, but it means it's not, you know, it's not a good option. It's not the right option probably for if you need to get a simple site up in in a few hours in the way that you can do with with tools like WordPress. And Code Red is is like a, a sort of opinionated distribution of Wagtail that means you can do those things. So uh, you can build a Code Red site and uh, it uses Bootstrap and you can theme it quickly and uh, and it includes a lot of the kind of standard models that you would need. I guess, you know, a, a good use case would be a, a marketing site. And I'd encourage you to check it out. It's a really, it's a nice project and it, it's grown fast. It's also been built in a way that you can uh, eject. I think that's the terminology people are using now. If you if you find you're at the limits of what Code Red can do, you can just, it, it's still just a Wagtail site. So you can, you can continue working on that. I know Tim's been quite involved in the Code Red community and, um, and probably knows more about it than me, but it's been great to see the, the arrival of Code Red. Um, as well as the, the official documentation, there's increasingly some excellent community content and the, 
thing I'd like to highlight most is the bottom of this list. Um, uh, Taylor Petolian, who, uh, who's uh, from Canada, who is, has made an amazing series of video tutorials around Wagtail, which you'll find easily um, on if you search for it on Google or YouTube. And um, really high production standards, very kind of thoughtful overview, and a lot of answers for, for common questions. So I'd re recommend checking those out. And that's that's been a big boost to us, I think. And uh, Caleb uh, has joined the core team, which is great news too. I want to talk as well about things which aren't which aren't so great. And of course, you know, there's uh, there was challenges in in these projects as well as successes. Um, first is probably around front end tooling, and this is something that. I guess if you were if you wanted to implement Wagtail to build your site, then this probably wouldn't concern you. But for um, developers working on Wagtail itself, improving it, this is becoming a bit of a pain point. We we when we built Wagtail in originally in 2013, it was quite you know quite a kind of clean, well-designed implementation based on Django templates and jQuery. And um, as that has uh, as, as it's got more complex, and we've got stream fields that allow all the sort of um, flexibility that Tim described then some of those decisions are starting to creak a bit and uh, you know ideally i think we would we would refactor a lot of this and probably turn it into uh, a react app with you know using the built-in api and um we and uh, and presenting the the ui in, in in a modern javascript framework of some sort and you know it's a bit, it's a bit of a challenge because that's a lot of work i think that could be you know six months refactoring work that won't have an immediate benefit to the to the end users. It, authors may not even notice note the difference, but it will mean that um, as a as a platform for us to continue improving, then we're using modern technologies which which don't slow us down. This is a related point, really. There's there's a lot that we'd like to do to improve the UI. The UI I think is is really nice, and is, that's one of the reasons of its success over the years is that uh, we put a lot of attention into this. But as um, uh, as for the reasons I just gave, it's not as easy as we would like for us to kind of really keep maintaining it as kind of the, the best of breed user interface. Diversity. This 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 is referring to the diversity of the team really, and uh, um, and 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 you know the the most common contributors. This is not a problem that's unique to Wagtail at all, but most of the most of the people in the team and most of the people contributing on GitHub and elsewhere are white men and um and you know we'd really like to we'd really like to change that it's not it's it's it's, uh, it's complete it's all not all white men at all of course but we 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 want to represent uh you know the, the diverse diverse society that that we live in and uh, and you know we're, we're we're making some efforts to improve that but um, i'm really uh interested in ideas people have to to help Deployment remains a bit of an issue. Um, so this is once you've built your site, getting it live. And again, this isn't this isn't at all unique to Wagtail, but is it's just it's still really the story a bit for Python web apps, where uh, it's um, this you know even I don't know ten years on, it's uh, it's not as easy as it should be to take your app and put it live. And there are some good solutions. There's uh, so Divio.com have have made some really uh, the progress in this area and um, Heroku is a good option for a lot of people and you know things like Zappa serverless um, serverless Python on, on AWS and more recently Google Cloud Run which I really like these are all really good options and, and you can you can use particularly the last two the serverless ones to, to create massive sites that scale to millions of users but it's just not as easy as I would like I, I really want it to be something that you uh, you you know you, you, you build your site in a few hours, you get something that you're happy with, and then it's you know five minutes to get it live on site without having to understand deployment. So this is not a, a Wagtail problem, but I, 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 as as a kind of member of the the Python web community, I would like Wagtail to help fix this. Um, what's next? I'm, I'm I think I'm probably running out of time, so I'll just talk briefly about about some of the things on our roadmap. It's going to be a continued focus on accessibility. As I said, there's a lot of enthusiasm about this, um, and uh, I don't want to sound kind of mercenary or cynical, but I also think this is an opportunity because, quite rightly, people around the world are starting to require this in the tools that they use. And you know, this is true in the UK government, and also I think increasingly in, in the US government and, and elsewhere around the world. And and where other tools are failing on these points, then you know that's that's an opportunity for us to to get more uh, to more usage in in the kind of places where we want to see it. Um, headlessness. This is a big area, and I'm sure this is the uh, this is a topic that's being covered a lot elsewhere in this conference. 
Um, this is a it's it's a growing trend. Um, it's not even a particularly new trend now, but the idea that you decouple the part of your your technology that handles management of content and uh, uploading images and so on and uh, and workflows, and then the part that displays it. And and a traditional Wagtail site, Wagtail handles takes care of both parts of that. You know, it, uh, it has its own templates for for displaying this. But increasingly, people are wanting to build their own front ends um, using tools like Vue or React or perhaps mm, mobile apps or you know other other front ends and um and wagtail handles this pretty well it has a it has a built-in rest api that it was actually originally refactored by uh, tom christie the author of django rest framework who's pretty you know is a big name in the django world um and uh and it's it, it it so it does a good job of this but we don't promote it very well so uh, i think we can do a better job of marketing that and and providing documentation and then there's graphql which is like the some of you will be familiar with this is like a, the next generation of um, of API, uh, open source by Facebook, and um, increasingly used as a as an, an alternative with some interesting implications. There's going to be an increased focus on the UI, um, really, with the result of the uh, hand in hand with a kind of refactor that I talked about. And uh, yeah, we're 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 excited to see what what the possibilities are around that. And internationalization is another area where. Um, Wagtail, Wagtail, you know, there has has supported multi-language sites from the beginning, but there are maybe three or four different routes for doing this at the moment. There's a quite a popular option called Wagtail Model Translation, which is built on Model Translation, which is quite a, a well-known Django feature. Um, but uh, that's that works at field level, and there are um, it's not, that's not always the right mix. So um, having a, a kind of standard and well-documented approach for internationalization is going to be important to us. And I think I'm going to end on documentation, which is probably perhaps not the most exciting ending, but um, I feel like this is one of the most important parts of an open source project. And uh, we, we've done pretty well with this, particularly um, uh, Wagtail's documentation is quite comprehensive, but it's, uh, it's, not, it's not always easy to find the answers that you want. And um, we also have a few little gripes with the uh, the system that we're using to generate it. We're using restructured text, um, which is uh, runs on sort of a system called Sphinx. And uh, I think just Markdown is a much uh, easier format to work with. So we're looking at um, replacing our documentation, at least the documentation engine, and then starting to rewrite the documentation. And I think that though it's not the most glamorous part of an open source project, it's it really is one of the most important because if you can, if your documentation is good enough to draw people in in the first 20 minutes and give them a feel of how the project works and how they can get started, then I think that's the difference between rapid adoption and uh, people moving on to see the next shiny thing. Uh, I think I'm going to wrap up there. Um, and uh, I don't think there are any questions, but um, if anyone has, if anyone still here is, is interested, then then they should ask here or otherwise feel free to uh, to ping me or Tim on uh, on on Twitter. Um, I'm available on Wagtail CMS and also Tom D. Uh, and I'll, the last thing I'll say is, uh, is about the, uh, the Slack channel, which is pretty active and supportive, and that's at wagtail.io forward slash Slack. Tim, any last things from you? No, I think you covered it beautifully. I just want to say thank you to everybody for coming out and taking a look. Um, this is also being recorded, so if you're seeing this on recording, please feel free to also join us on the Slack. Um, on the Wagtail Slack or catch either of us on Twitter, as Tom said, um, and uh, and get involved. It's it's been a really great project, and you know to tie things together, um, you know after a couple of years, every CMS I've worked with in the past um, has begun to show its warts and things like that. And while Wagtail is not perfect, we'll keep working on that. Um, it has been flexible enough that I haven't had to just throw everything up in the air and start from scratch. Um, so it's been great for me that way. And uh, as you can see, I've gotten more and more involved. It seems like just yesterday, Tom and I met, but it was actually 2015 now back in uh, back in Austin, Texas at ChangoCon 2015 was when we first met. And I mentioned that we were trying the beta of Wagtail for Wharton and uh, the start of a beautiful friendship. <laughs> That's right. Here we are today. Thanks, Tim. And thanks everyone for coming. I hope, I hope that was helpful. And um, yeah, look, Maybe maybe see you in, in real life at the next uh, CMS Philly. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.